and then we can get started parallelly in the session. So for this, today it would be mostly about the individual presentations that we would be having. And to discuss on those topics, we have Mr. Mark Lowry, who is the founder of founder and managing partner at Pitchmark LLP, Singapore. And we have Bob Zidman, who is the president and founder at Zidman Consulting USA. And we have Frank Redman, who is the legal advisor at Pitchmark LLP Thailand. And we have Stephen Key, who is the co-founder at uh, Invent Right. So we'll start with the presentations, having the individual topics, and I will pass on the mic to Mr. Mark to proceed further. Thank you and uh, good morning everybody. Uh, to uh, borrow a phrase from the Disney animated movie Madagascar, the one where they're shipwrecked and then the zebra, Marty, uh, builds a nice bar. In this conference, in this room, you've come to the fun side of the island uh, because we're going to be talking about the coal face of commercialization of IP, uh, whereas some of the other rooms are probably discussing some of the more uh, uh, esoteric aspects of patenting and so on. We're going to take it to the cold face. Uh, Stephen is going to talk about his incredible success in helping people on the ground, individuals who've come up with funky ideas, to help them license those ideas. He's written books, appears on television, writes for Forbes and a bunch of others. So we're looking forward to Stephen's presentation uh, in, in just a few moments. Uh, Frank Rittman is uh, so unassuming but he is the guy who governments around the region fear the most. Because when Frank Rittman comes a-calling, usually it's because those governments have not done the right thing by the movie studios when it comes to licensing content for public display. So once again, a representative of the coalface of the creation of intellectual property. And over here, I did catch a glimpse of Bob's uh, PowerPoint slide, which says that he is a high-stakes poker player not sure how that's relevant to your presentation on, on the courtroom, but uh, that's in fact uh, where we're going to start. Um, because when you are at the coalface of the creation of IP, you're looking to defend it. You're looking to deter anybody from ripping it off. You're looking to actually license it and make money from it. We really have to take a step down to the individuals who actually create the intellectual property that our whole industry is then based around. So in our courtroom today, just to set Bob up for his presentation, we're going to have the, the plaintiffs on the right side over here, and we're going to have the defendants on this side. Uh, judge Frank, and uh, we have a panel of two judges, so just to keep it interesting, Judge Frank and Judge Stephen, are going to adjudicate in a copyright case. Um, on the prosecution side, on the, on the plaintiff's side. Did I say the plaintiff's were on this side of the room earlier? Okay, the plaintiff's over here. Um, you're arguing the, that I ripped off your software. And you're arguing that I am in breach of copyright. Your job is to persuade these two gentlemen that, yep, Mark, sorry, but clearly there is a lot of similarity between the software that I wrote and the ones, the one that you wrote, that is the one that your client wrote. And on the defense side, you're going to have to help me out a little because you can probably look through my lines of code and see a conspicuous number of similarities between my code and their client's code. So, how do you go about proving that? How do you go about proving that I ripped off your copyright? How would you do it? Go to the court. Sorry? <laughs> Go to the court. Go to the court, sure. But <laughs> Frank and, and Stephen, they're not software experts. They have no idea. They're going to have to take your words for it. So, concretely, how will you prove that I ripped off your client's copyright? Similar source codes. Similar source code. Right, so, so what do you do? You kind of open them in, in GitHub or something and then kind of look through? Is that the strategy? shift the burden of proof. Uh, for the fun side of the island, that's probably a bit too heavy for our conversation, but, but in, in essence, you are going to have to find a way, maybe as a comparing the two codes. Yeah, how similar are they? How similar? In terms of percentage, perhaps. Yeah, percentage of similarity. 
Um, what if this uh, piece of software has, what's the average piece of software? Two million lines of code? 20 million lines. Actually, these days it's hard to say, but two million, mm -hmm. two million to 20 million. Two million to 20 million. So you're going to look through two to 20 million lines of code. Okay, good luck with that. I feel my case has been bolstered already. Um, what about the defense? How are you going to help me out and prove that I did not rip off your lines of code? How, how are you going to help defend me against this gentleman over here who's going to look through two million lines of code? This forensic work on the software and look at how many lines are actually being written and proprietary by, by yourself, which is used in free open source or other sources of licensing. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're going to help. Also, you're going to look through two million lines of code for me just to make sure that. Oh. <laughs> Mark, the computer will do it for us. The computer will do that? And, and what sort of. Uh, how will you run that on the computer? Probably get a forensic company who's got the software to look at the different lines of code. Forensic company to look at the different lines of code. Judges, I hope you're ready. Judge Frank? Can I offer a suggestion from the bench? Yes, uh, Your Honor. One of the criteria that we might look for is whether the defendant had any prior access the original work that's claimed to have been infringed. Well, with, with respect, Your Honor, that's a... Uh, possibly two people okay. had come up with completely the same ideas. Well, I can't be a judge to have stolen your idea if I never saw your idea in the first place. Yes, you see how complex the matter is. Uh, and good morning. Thank you for joining the prosecution team here on the right and the defense team on the left. Uh, good. I'm so pleased that you're here pro bono. Uh, thank you very much. Um, but that's precisely the issue, right? How do you make sure, how do, what sort of software do you run in order to check whether or not this, like this software code that I wrote is in fact a ripoff or not? Enter Bob Zeidman. Please give him a big hand as he launches into his defense. Thank you, Mark. That was a great introduction. I really appreciate that because that's going to lead into what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to answer the poker question in two different ways, actually. Because, first of all, the reason I include, here, I'll put this on here, the reason I include poker in my background is initially when I started playing poker, it was among friends. I actually, uh, I was living in California and I came to Vegas, played in a tournament where two of the top players in the world were invited to play. And I beat everybody. I won the tournament. First tournament I ever played in my life. Um, it hasn't been as good since then, but uh, it got me excited about it. But I didn't tell people because I thought this is not really a respectable thing to be doing, playing poker. But it turns out that people, world famous people have come up to me. I started uh, blogging about it on Facebook. And world famous people would come up to me, uh, you know, I'd run into them somewhere at a conference and they'd say, how's the poker going? And it turns out that so many people are interested in poker that I started uh, making it public that I played and I started having a blog about it and people love it. The other thing I've found is that I work as an expert witness and I think the same skills actually that make me, I think, a very good expert witness uh, also make me a good poker player. And by that I mean when I'm in deposition or e even uh, in more extreme circumstances when I'm in trial and I'm being cross-examined by a lawyer who says, uh, you know, you didn't actually look at this piece of source code, did you? And in my mind, I may be saying, oh my god, I don't think I looked at that. What did I do? I made a conclusion, and I didn't look at all the software, and I can't say that out loud, and my, the attorneys that I'm working for are watching me, and, but on the outside, I'm very calm. And I say, yes, I actually did look at that software. Um, and it's the same thing in poker when I either uh, turn over a pair of aces, and I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm going to win this hand and make a lot of money, and this is really terrific, and I can't believe it. Or, uh, when I get to the end, and I have nothing, and I've just bet a lot of money, and I'm thinking, I'm going to be out of this tournament, I'm going to lose all this money, I can't believe what I'm doing. Um, and yet, I have the ability to have this stone-cold face, or even actually smile and say things. And uh, uh, the fact is, in poker, I don't do this as an expert, but in poker, I mislead people purposely by, uh, you know, pretending that I'm really confident that I'm going to win this hand and hopefully get them to fold their better hand. So if your poker is so successful you're still in the software business. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Well, uh, soft, you know, it's interesting. So in the tournament, I only play tournaments. I actually won two tournaments since then in the last year, roughly a year. Uh, but I've lost a lot of tournaments, but I've beaten some of the top players, and it's really a thrill. I tell people that, you know, I can't get on the court with LeBron James. Uh, you know, he would never, ever play me. I wouldn't have enough money to have an exhibition game, and if I did play him, I would certainly lose very quickly. 
However, I can enter a tournament and play the top players in the entire world and beat them. And I've done that. So it's a pretty exciting thing. Having Moving on from that, I'd be glad to talk about it later. Um, well, I should go back. I've written, so I'm the founder of Seidman Consulting and Software Analysis and Forensic Engineering Corporation. The consulting company provides consulting services for litigation engineering consulting. The uh, other company, the software company, also known as SAFE Corporation, provides tools for detecting copyright infringement. And I'll talk about that a little bit. I've written a book on software IP. Uh, I've worked on a bunch of cases, including Facebook, We Connect You, which was made into the movie The Social Network. Uh, and then, of course, Google, Oracle v. Google that went to the Supreme Court. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, I just want to make sure. I'm going to talk about several things, but I want to talk about honest mistakes. I'm going to talk about experts, why we need experts to follow standards. Uh, right now, there just aren't a lot of standards. Copyright infringement of software is a specific example. But I'm going to talk about honest mistakes, honest disagreements, uh, outright lying, the, the problems with not having standards, and then I'm going to propose, in very loose terms, some standards. So this, I want to get to this next. So I have a quotation here where the misapplication of forensic science has contributed to 52% of wrongful convictions in, in innocent project cases. Now this is a quotation from the Innocence Project that refers to criminal uh, cases, criminal lawsuits. Obviously, we're dealing with intellectual property, which are civil, typically civil lawsuits. But this has been a problem. This is something I recognize coming into the field as an expert witness that also exists in intellectual property cases. In other words, uh, experts are hired, and for a number of reasons that I'll go over, they, give the, they often give the opinions that their clients want. And because there are no standards to judge their opinions, these opinions get accepted. Now, I believe if you have two experts on either side, uh, that uh, the one who's more credible will typically convince the judge or jury, but I'm going to go over examples where I've seen that not happen, and that's why I think we need uh, standards. But I'm also going to read something here that I have that uh, about a case I read recently, a murder case where a man was wrongly convicted of murder. And it says that uh, to support its theory in the case against Mr. Williams, this was the suspect who was convicted, the state presented expert testimony from forensic pathologist Dr. Nancy Jones, who conducted the autopsy, and it says that she was able to determine the time of death of the victim in a very narrow period of time. September 22nd, no later than 1 a.m., uh, between that date and Thursday, September 23rd, and then was able to narrow it down further to the morning of September 23rd. The problem is there was no scientific basis for this. There was no scientific method that could predict the time of death that precisely. But the suspect had an alibi for all other times except for that morning. And so the man was convicted. Later on, a DNA test was done that exonerated him. But that was years after he had spent time in prison. So we've all heard about these things. And there's more, uh, there's more work being done for standards in criminal forensics, but not so much in IP forensics. So I think there are honest mistakes, and you'll tell me when I, if I'm getting, uh, going over the time. Yep, uh, seven and a half minutes. Okay. So, uh, you know, there are honest mistakes. Uh, one example I can tell you is a very well-known expert witness who was up against me in a case at trial. He opined on a specific patent claim, and uh, among others, a number of patent claims. And uh, our attorneys did some research over a weekend. He testified on Friday. <coughs> on Monday morning, they got up there and found that he had testified about the wrong patent claim. It was actually a claim that wasn't at issue. Now, you know, that's an honest mistake. I think it's a pretty bad mistake. And the expert should have been responsible for that and the lawyers. Interestingly enough, my client lost the case despite the defense. I was working for the patent holder. The, uh, the alleged infringer did not have a defense for that particular claim. And yet the jury decided in their favor anyway. Fortunately, there was a settlement afterwards because the attorneys realized that they were not going to win on appeal. It would be reversed on appeal. Uh, and then uh, one time I was working, my team and I were working up to a certain deadline. I asked the attorneys, please stop making changes. They were making changes to my report. 
my uh, response is that I have to read everything in my report before I sign it. Uh, this was due at midnight on the East Coast, 9 o'clock Pacific, where I was. At about two minutes to nine, they emailed me another change to my report. And uh, I read it. I got it in at, at exactly at midnight. I don't know what they did on the other end. I emailed it to them. And then three months later, I went for deposition. And uh, when they handed me my report, it turns out an entire section of my report was missing. So once again, uh, this time, I don't recall if, it, if I was working for the defendant or the plaintiff, you know, the accused infringer, the patent holder. But uh, the other side said, you have no response for this, uh, for this patent. Therefore, we win on that. Uh, the case settled. But you know, these are honest mistakes. I mean, they're bad mistakes, pretty critical mistakes. But nobody was doing anything malicious. Then there are honest disagreements. This happens a lot in patent cases. Uh, you get things like claim construction, claim interpretation, non-infringing alternatives. These are all things that are open to interpretation. There's gray areas. I've had uh, I've disagreed with every expert on you know on the other side. I've disagreed with them. Um, but usually it's about an interpretation and understanding, and you know that goes before the judge or jury and they make a decision. Trade secrets cases are even more. There's more disagreement. Uh, exactly. Usually it's pretty uh, clear whether the uh, owner of the trade secret, alleged trade secret, uh, kept it secret. But there's always disagreement. Was this was was this known? Was it generally known? Was it generally ascertainable? Uh, so those are things that I'm not that concerned about. But then, honest, you get outright lying. Uh, this has been a concern of mine for a long time. So some examples is uh, I represented a small company that was a defendant against a very large company. The expert on the other side never examined any software code, but started pointing to these very complex file names and path names, and the judge was very confused. Uh, at the end, I explained it all to the judge. It was a bench trial. Uh, we thought he understood. We went out and celebrated with a big dinner and drinks. And maybe a month later, he came back and said in his decision that he didn't understand the technology, so he was going to split the baby. And uh, half the trade secrets went to my client, half went to the large company. We each had to rewrite half our software. My company was a startup, couldn't afford to rewrite its software, and it went out of business. Uh, that really bothered me. There was another time where I went up against someone that I had trained as an expert. Uh, and the judge had stated that object code was not an issue, uh, only source code. And it turns out that uh, the other party did not have their source code. This was a case that uh, went back many, many years, and the uh, plaintiff had not kept their source code. So really, the case was over at that point. But two things happened, actually. The expert invented a term called object source code. It's a non-technical term. There's no such definition. There's no such thing. But he was able to get the object code in to the trial because the judge didn't understand that he had invented a new term for object code and referred to it as object source code. The other thing that happened is I'll just uh, go down to the, where it says this source code. The same expert, uh, unfortunately, had created some source code as a demonstration of what the original source code looked like, introduced it at trial, and kept referring to it as this source code. And we realized that the jury came to the understanding that this was the actual source code, not something created during trial. We actually lost on this case. It was a big case. We lost. But fortunately, three months later, the appeals court overturned the decision and strongly criticized the expert. But there are no penalties, and I'll talk about that. Experts, unfortunately, can say whatever they want. And if there's a disagreement, even a major one, say, well, I misunderstood or you misunderstood the technology. I'll also mention two other things <clears throat> at the bottom there. One thing that's happening a lot lately in protective orders, I talked uh, yesterday about how the experts should come in early on the protective orders. We have a lot of parties who are putting extreme restrictions on the protective orders and experts who are supporting them. One expert in a recent case that I was up against uh, claimed that uh, it was never necessary to print out source code. And uh, if you've ever worked in, especially in a patent case, if you have to make a case to a judge or a jury or at deposition, you have to be able to support your, your analysis of the code. And the only way to do that is to point to specific sections of code and explain how they work. 
And yet in this case, the expert on the other side, who had just finished a case against me, where we had printed out source code, uh, said that, no, I never print out source code, and it's never necessary. Unfortunately, companies are pressing for this, because if you, you know, especially defendants in a patent case, for example, because if you can't print out source code, you can't show infringement. It just becomes two experts, one saying it does infringe, and I saw it, but I can't tell you where, and the other one saying, nope, I saw the same thing, and uh, he's wrong. And then justification of code, uh, sorry, uh, the justifying the destruction of code. I've been in cases where experts said that, oh, the, the other party has a process of uh, destroying their code and scrubbing their disks. That's just something they do regularly. And so when you've asked us to turn over the code, they don't have it. Uh, and I can justify, you know, I can verify that many companies do this. That's an outright lie. Uh, companies do have destruction processes, but of course, once they're served with a, a lawsuit, they have to preserve their code but I've seen the destruction after being served with a lawsuit. Uh, so I specialize in copyright infringement, software copyright infringement, uh, and the defenses, now I've worked for plaintiffs and defendants, but usually when someone is guilty, when a party is guilty, they can find an expert who will say only a little copying. We should know that only a little copying of the most critical parts of the code is copyright infringement, but unfortunately we have a a, a guilty party, a party that we find is guilty of, uh, of copying code, the defense is always that we, there's only a little bit of copying, so it's insignificant. Uh, confusing irrelevant statistics, often this happens with university professors who are hired as experts, again for a defendant. They'll say, oh, well, I did the statistical analysis. I was in one recently where the, uh, the defense witness said that uh, there was a tiny percentage if you take into account all the code that this company has ever written in its history, it's only 0.0001%, so how could that be copyright infringement? My response, uh, I don't think it went into my report, but my response to the lawyers was why not divide by all the code ever written in the history of mankind? It's, it's an irrelevant statistic, but it sounds good to judges and juries. Oh, this was a complex statistic. Uh, fake personal experience, sometimes they just say, oh, I've looked at this and in my experience it is copied or it's not copied. And I don't think that should be acceptable, but I find that a lot. There's contradictory depo testimony, perjury and deposition, um, and, and one problem is, no, is there are no penalties for any of this. Again, the excuse is just that, well, it's technical and two technical experts disagree. So what I've done I've spent the last 20 years of my career trying to change this for copyright infringement cases. And what I've done is, first of all, you, uh, I feel that you must examine the source code. There was actually a recent court case, I don't recall which one, very recent, within the past month or two, where a judge threw out a, uh, an expert's opinion because the expert had not examined the source code. Actually, I have a, I have a colleague who I don't think works anymore um, because he didn't get past the Daubert challenge because he claimed that some source code worked in a certain way, and under cross-examination, he admitted that he derived that from the marketing materials. Um, so fortunately, that is changing. Judges are requiring code analysis, but I have seen cases, I've been up in cases, where uh, the code was never examined. In fact, I have a lot of rebuttals when I'm working for a plaintiff. If I find copying, the rebuttal is often uh, what he found isn't right, but there's no counterexamples. I mean, that happens in patent cases, too, where it frustrates me there's no counterexamples. If you think this is wrong, then you should show the source code and explain why what I found is not copying or not infringement uh, and show how it's actually the opposite of what I said. But often it's just an opinion that it's not true. So I've created a set of tools called Code Suite. Uh, I can tell you my software company, it's a small company. It's been fairly successful as a very small company. My consulting business has grown because of these tools, and I'd actually like other people to use them. Uh, they compare code in a way that's very well defined. All the algorithms are patented, which means they're also public. They're described in the user's materials, in the user's guides. And I train people on how to use them. The important thing is there have been tools like this. Some of them, some experts have used proprietary tools. So the problem is they put it into their black box. It comes up with copied or not copied and they can't explain how it works. 
So these tools are fully explainable. Both sides can use them. Both sides can, can judge what the results are and disagree on what the results are. But these tools take hundreds of thousands of lines of code or millions of lines of code and come up with uh, maybe hundreds of lines of code that show signs of copying that cannot be explained by anything but copying. There's a filtering process to filter out everything that's not protectable. What it comes up with is hundreds of lines of code, and then it's an easy disagreement, if there is a disagreement, on those hundreds of lines of code as opposed to hundreds of thousands or millions of lines of code. And then I offer certification in the tools. Now again, you know, this is a little bit self-promotion, but really for years I've been trying to get this standardized because I'm not aware of any other process like this other than haphazard and, and ad hoc uh, methods of doing this. Then also, I teach a process that my consulting company use, uh, performs. So uh, in, in previous tools that mostly came out of academia, the tools would basically say copy or not copy. You put both programs in, and it would say copy or not copy. I've actually gotten calls from parents of students at universities because the tool uh, the tool that's used in academia is used throughout the world at universities. And I even got a call from a patent attorney, a high-powered patent attorney that I've worked for. And I thought it was about a case, but it turns out it was because his son was accused of cheating because uh, this tool uh, that's being used, the, the, I won't say competitor, it's a free tool coming out of Stanford University, my alma mater, uh, that basically is used all over, it's free, but the results are completely unreliable. And one of the things that makes it unreliable, there's a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is it comes out copied or not copied, whereas I teach a process for filtering out those unprotectable things. And the biggest example is open source code. You can have two programs that use the same open source code. If you run it through one of these programs, it'll say copy. But if you run it through our code suite, and you've gone through the training to filter things out, which is actually very easy, the tool helps you do that, it'll find open source code on the web and say, oh, this is open source, it flags it, and you can say, okay, eliminate that and see what's left. So you're not accusing someone. So in summary, uh, basically what I found is uh, that engineers from industry or academia are brought in as expert witnesses. They often have no forensic background. They may have done some copyright cases. Often they haven't. Actually, in one case, uh, this was a nice case. I was working for a defendant. Um, interesting case. Uh, his whole career depended on uh, him winning this case. It was, uh, what I would say, it was a malicious case. It was brought maliciously against him. There was no evidence that he had copied anything. The expert on the other side, at deposition, I, I had an idea. I just got this into my head. and I. At the break, I talked to the attorney, and I said, ask him where he learned about copyright, uh, software copyright infringement. And so we, after the break, they asked him, and I was sitting in the room, and he pointed at me and said, oh, I read Mr. Zeidman's book. Um, I figured at that point we had probably won the case, <laughs> and we did. And uh, the defendant went on to a successful career with his own company. But unfortunately, these people, a lot of people don't have the background. They haven't been trained. There are no standards. There's no penalties. And uh, I, I think that should change. With patents, it's very difficult to do. I understand it. I've looked at processes, procedures for patent uh, experts, but they vary from technology to technology, <coughs> patent to patent. But software copyright is very easy to create standards. I've done it. I'd love others to adopt it. Um, and so if anyone has uh, any ideas or questions about that, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Still sweating, um, that because the, as you can see, the prosecution has grown substantially during the course of your presentation. My defence team seems to have shrunk. Uh, so, in a case like this, where uh, this gentleman kindly suggested checking out the source code, um, how would that now work in practice? Would, would you now take my code, run it through your funky black box, and then everybody knows, or is there still the risk that they'll say, "Yeah, I, I saw the." Ops source uh, code analyzer, but we don't believe it because we have other ways of looking at it. So it's typically, typically the party that is in the right uses my tool and hires me. Um, they really don't want me or my tools or my team. If either if they're accusing someone of copyright infringement and it's not there, or uh, 
somebody actually did copy doesn't want an expert to find it. There are also times, I, by the way, there are plenty of times when I tell uh, clients that they don't have a case. Not a lot, but occasionally I will do that. But the point is that, um, so a lot of times if I'm on one side, the other side does not use our tool because it will contradict, they want to be able to contradict what I find and they, it's very difficult to contradict the results with my tool. What they will do though is, so your defense, my advice to the defense, which unfortunately works occasionally, is basically to say that what he found is standard stuff. And if you divide it up, uh, if you divide it up, you can find standard programming elements, right? So I, when I explain it to a judge or jury, and they usually get this, but unfortunately not 100%, I say if you take uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, you can simply dismiss it and say, oh, it's a bunch of English language words, everybody knows the English language, um, there's nothing there. But I see that a lot in software, and unfortunately they buy it. They'll say, well, it's a bunch of statements. And I say, well, look, it's, it's a bunch of statements with this one variable name that we can't find in any other code, and we've searched the entire web for it, and it's specific to these two programs, and that means that that's an indicator of copying, and uh, there's no other explanation. The, the other thing that happens, though, your defense then would say, well, that's one word out of, you know, there's, there's 7,325 words in our program, so you haven't found anything. It's, but my response to that is that if you're investigating a murder, you'll find a fingerprint. That fingerprint does not mean that a person's finger was in the room. It means that it's conclusive evidence that the person was in the room. So when we find one variable, they can only be explained by copying, and we can't find it elsewhere on the web, and it's not a common English language word or any language. We actually once had Hungarian. Um, we say that's indication, an indicator that this entire function was copied, this entire file was copied. But they try to, you know, the, the defense in that case will typically say, oh, it's one word, who cares? Right, so in other words, I'm in trouble now. Uh, because your prosecution team, by the way, was that correlation or causation that you're always on the winning team? That's just a joke. Uh, judges, how are you doing? Uh, are you any clearer now? Should I be cleared of the, uh, the copyright infringement charges? Or would you like to explain it in Hungarian? Still deliberating. Still deliberating. So, and I guess that's your point, Bob, right? That if there was a common standard that's applied to the analysis, the prosecution would look at that and accept it. The defense would look at that and accept it. And the judges might actually understand it. That's your point. Yes, exactly. There might be some controversy. And, and the, the example is the Hungarian word. It was interesting. We did an analysis. But we, we were very careful. We, uh, my team and I, we don't accuse someone of doing something wrong unless we can really stand behind that. So in one case, we found this one variable that was just seemed like a random string of characters. It was in both programs. And we thought, but we couldn't find anything else. So we finally sent that to the lawyers and said, can the programmers tell us what this is? And they said, oh, that's a common, lang you know, common Hungarian word for index or something. <laughs> and, and both parties had, had hired Hungarian programmers. So we eliminated that. Once we eliminated that, there was no evidence of copying. Right, uh, final opportunity to ask questions, comments, in which case, no. It's adjourned. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Zeman, thank you very much. Thank you.